This time I will present the transmission pathway of infections. The presentation order is... You should know these things in conclusion, depending on how you pay attention to each transmission pathway. The standard precaution is expressed as S. I will explain it to you by dividing it into five such as the airborne precaution, droplet precaution, contact precaution, and lastly, vector-borne precaution, including pests and parasites. Before we start with these standards and cautions, you should know the basic principles of the transmission pathway. Regarding the pathogens, they usually have a place they like. It's called a reservoir. So the pathogens grow in the reservoir and they may become part of the dirt, water, and then humans. So a large number of pathogens grow as a result. That's how they enter the host. And there is a transmission pathway for that. An influenza virus present in one person comes out in the form of cough and pollute the outside environment from where it spreads by entering into another person. And if you wear a mask or keep a distance, the transmission route will be cut off. So breaking the chain of infection will actually be a practical method to cut a transmission pathway. So this is what we have to see in this chapter. There is a chain of infection like number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And then a pathogen comes out, goes around and then enter back into another person. So this is a very famous infection link. Let's take a quick look at this and understand how infectious pathogens invade the human body. This drawing is from Australia. I am not dividing all standard precautions, but going to divide it into two. In the United States there is an American way and in Australia it is centered on England way, which is either direct or indirect transmission. For example, the spreading of gonorrhea or syphilis through kissing and having sex is direct transmission. And then Australia doesn't divide into droplet infection, cold or air infection. That's how it is in Australia. In Korea, when it comes to paying attention to each infectious route, we do it according to the US Acts. So the United States divides all the infectious pathogens as standard precautions, airborne precautions, droplet precautions, and contact precautions. If you need to be careful of air when you go to a hospital, there will be a pink tag. That means beware of aerosols below 5 micrometers. So there will be a tag like this if you go to the room of a person suffering from tuberculosis to prevent those germs that cause tiny aerosols. So it's like airborne isolation. What that means is that germs are transmitted to the air, so be careful. Regarding droplet precaution, a droplet is of 5 micrometers or more. Look at this case. It's yellow. The pink and yellow tags are similar. What's the difference? Yes, the mask is different. N9 masks are used for airborne precautions, so it is a blue-colored mask which filters almost 95% of the air. You must wear a special mask. And for the droplet precaution, a regular mask like this can be used, as we are doing now for COVID-19. It is a regular mask. So it is droplet isolation. So this is how we distinguish these. In the case of contact precaution, a green mark is added, and it is called contact isolation. What do you see? You'll find it to wear a gown and then gloves. That's how it is marked. What that means is that you can have germs, so be careful and wear personal protective equipment like this. So what is standard precaution then? Yes, standard precaution refers to protect from all germs. Regardless of whether there is a pathogen or not, whether you have a disease or not, germs might move around between people, for example, the blood spills. And if you are touching the blood, don't touch it with bare hands. So according to the principles of standard precaution, you must wear gloves. Regarding the standard precaution. When you touch food, as well as blood, body fluids, secretions and excrement, make sure to be careful. And these things fall under the category of standard precaution. This is for the protection of everyone. So standard precaution is used to protect yourself and others. Now there are airborne and droplet infections, and you are probably wondering 
how airborne and droplet infections are different. So now, if I try to explain airborne and droplet infections to you, suppose you have an arrow in the sky like this. That is the direction of the pathogen. When you sneeze, germs come out from your nose. These airborne bacteria. The size of the microorganisms is smaller than 5 micrometers because it is airborne. So you can see the little pathogens here right now. Those things come out of the host. The pathogens do not fall off. They just go up. Can you see it slightly curling up? These are diseases such as tuberculosis, measles, chickenpox and other like these. Ordinary masks can't really block these things. The reason is that it can pass through all the holes in the mask. And now take a look at the droplet infection. It has a particle size greater than 5 micrometers. So there's moisture in it when it comes out. Its size is about 5 micrometers and even if it's dried, so it's heavy now and falls forward. And it can go no further than 1.5 or 2 meters and then sink. That's why we differ between airborne and droplet infections. So, what's causing it to be divided according to the size of the infectious pathogen? So now I will give you an idea about the droplet infections that are not airborne. Something transmitted by air. When you cough, all the droplets came out of the respiratory tract and are transferred into another person, so you can think of it as a droplet moving into the air. So the droplet transmission is almost 5 micrometers or more, such as severe acute respiratory syndrome, bird flu or swine flu, Middle East respiratory syndrome and COVID-19 virus. All are droplet infections. But it's weird. Look here. They are always heavily armed and equipped in the media. And as you can see in this picture, they always appear in the news. How did it happen? If it's a droplet, should not you pay attention to airborne infection? As you might say, what are these? These are all medical professionals. The ordinary public can use a disposable mask. But even if you are using a cloth mask, it will filter all 5 micrometers. But as a medical person, you have to take the sample. And you can also hug the patient like this. You can make an emergency, close contact immediately. Aerosols suddenly get generated in that case. It leads to a large number of aerosols presence. That's why ordinary masks are not allowed. So level D is for personal protection and all personal protective equipment from head to toe wearing is level D protective equipment. So this protective equipment is supposed to be worn. When is it required? It is when you enter the patient's room in order to protect the medical personnel. Because there shouldn't be anything on your clothes, they wear it. So I ask you not to get confused with this. This is a contact infection. If you eat something wrong, you will vomit and die. Contaminates water, food and then the patient's blood. Body fluids and secretions, especially stool and feces, play a major role in gastrointestinal infection. So this route is called the fecal to the oral route as the bacteria that come out through the feces enter another person's mouth. Diarrhea and vomiting are severe symptoms. Have you guys heard of different types of infection or cholera, bacterial dysentery? In the past, there were many infections. There are not so many as we are in advanced country, but we still have very little salmonella type. Then there is the enterotoxin type E. coli. E. coli is Escherichia coli. Then there are hepatitis A bacteria which can cause hepatitis A if you eat the wrong food. Staphylococcus aureus is also a gastrointestinal infection. So far I have told A, airborne, D, droplet and then C, contact precaution. Now comes a pest, vector-borne infection. 
These may be parasites or mosquitoes. In Korea, parasite, roundworms, pinworms, hookworms and flatworms are almost gone. But there were a lot of such things in the past. There were many since the Korean War. So, people used fecal in the field. That's why we have a lot of fecal to oral transmission. So the path is like in the case of roundworms. Roundworms stay in a small intestine in human bodies, where it lays eggs which come out through feces entering the soil. If you don't wash someone else's lettuce or others, it might enter into someone else's intestine. So this is what the CDC looks like. You all are overseas. In Korea, these roundworms, pinworms, hookworms and flatworms are parasites. But when you go to another country, you can face some other disease. That's why if you go to another country, you must find out what is special about these parasites. You can stay healthy in this way. Next, I am going to talk about vector-borne precaution. Mosquitoes are the most important pests. Mosquitoes do more harm than good. They are nasty creatures. These are not annoying anymore now instead of the times of Alexander the Great, who died of malaria after being bitten by mosquitoes even after unifying all of Europe. That is why malaria is still a high cause of death. Almost 200 million to 300 million people are infected annually. The mortality rate is extremely high, especially in the tropics. It's a tick fever. In this type of vector-borne infections, ticks are the most important pests, which can also cause Lyme disease. If you see here, these ticks are also transmitted by Tsutsugamushi or, for example, Hantavirus. But get something like a grave, the insects are bitten. But this was the first time it has been done locally, and it turns red. However, these carry germs. And if bacteria such as Borrelia or something like that enters the human body, it stays still and after a long incubation period it destroys our kidneys and even leads to death. So well, erythema can also occur on the skin, but some people die of Tsutsugamushi disease due to conjunctivitis, fever, arthritis, muscle pain and nephritis. In Korea, these are infectious diseases. So in Korea, a lot of medical facilities are available. So when you have an infectious disease like this, you take antibiotics or antiviral drugs. I highlighted this color as red because it is transmitted through virus. So you can fix these things, but if you go to a third world country or something like that, you still can suffer very much from these diseases. So go to the hospital if you want to get rid of your fears from these things. You can go to a big hospital but most of them now have a clinic. So if you go abroad, then for example, Nigeria, there are many places with such data with some infectious outbreaks in Nigeria. Therefore, we recommend you to visit such places once you have received medication and get vaccinated. So when you go abroad, I hope you live happily and safely from any infectious disease. I will wrap up now. Thank you very much for your effort.